What's up, guys? Fantasy Aristotle back again for the Slump Buster Fantasy Football Show, episode 26. It is a solo episode with just me today, so I guess, let's see, let's just break to fantasy draft on three with just myself. So ready? One, two, three. Quiet on the set, make sure my mic is on There is Dre and Juju Dog diving towards the pylon Go for two, so damn rude, recognize authority Spitting tips for fantasy, no way you're outscoring me Bold predictions with conviction every single day Sports addiction, no restriction, kicking game like Pele He's the greatest, what's the basis? Pick an athlete, let's debate this game Outrageous trading places, sudden death, take ten paces Turn and shoot, voice the truth, Mamba mentality Future greats take their place, dreams be Come reality, low and outside, knocked it out the park. Your boy discovered fire like a rock with a spark. Refs acting like Neanderthals, phantom flags, nothing calls. Heartbreak losses, tragic falls. Every week discuss it all. Settle it, listen up. Free of time like Andrew Luck. Show's about to start. I suggest you buckle up. Fantasy draft. All right, guys, so we are here with fantasy season right around the corner. I can't wait. The drafts are happening a lot later this year because there are no preseason games this year, so we don't really know uh, competition-wise who's slotting into what position, what uh, depth chart position as well. The drafts this year are a bit later, which I tend to like. I like the draft a little bit later on, uh, generally after the third preseason game. That's generally where you get your um, dress rehearsal for your starters, so you pretty much know who's going to be starting uh, on the team. So that's typically where I like to draft, and this year we're slotting right around week four uh, for the draft. So that's, that's a pretty good time to draft. Uh, especially in normal years, but this is not a normal year. So we're right there on, on the cusp of all these drafts. So let's get down into, we have some pretty big running back news receiver wise, not too much to uh, report there. Most of everybody is practicing that should everybody that's come back from uh, injury or whatnot, they are pretty much back from that. So we're pretty much just right around some running back heavy news. So Derek Henry, uh, there have been reports that he's actually catching more and more confidently in practice. That's a good thing for Derrick Henry owners. Last year, he did not catch very many balls, and everybody's very wary of him in the first round because he's not catching anything in the passing game. Now he's actually catching more balls. That means more opportunity, more points, more yardage for you as a fantasy owner. So that's very good uh, to hear from Tennessee's training camp right now. So, hey, if you already did your draft and you have him, good job. If you don't have your draft set just yet, this is something to look forward to. Continuing with the news, Dalvin Cook still does not have a new contract and is actually broken off contract talks with the Vikings. This year with the new CBA, it's actually pretty different for rookies. So you can't really hold out anymore because if he were to hold out next year, instead of becoming a unrestricted free agent and possibly getting the franchise tag, he would actually become a restricted free agent which means the team can just sign him for about 4 to $8 million, which is a lot less than what he was wanting. And then he goes to an unrestricted free agent where he can get franchise tagged by the team again. So technically, if he does hold out, he's still under control of the team for at least two more years. So I see he's, I think he's going to play out this contract. He's going to be a little mad about it, but he is going to try to go out there and ball out. So next year, if they do franchise tag him, he has a little bit more leverage to actually negotiate in contract talks where he only has one year right now. Next year, he would have two solid years of production under his belt. Kenyon Drake has been spotted in a walking boot. He says this is nothing major. It's just minor bruising and tenderness there. So he should be ready for the start of the season. Another running back that should be ready for the start of the season is Miles Sanders coming back from a leg injury. They said that he should be back on track to start week one. So Boston Scott is trending down. Miles Sanders is now trending up. Beat writers for the Vegas Raiders, right? I think they're Vegas. I need to look into this because I don't know if they're the Las Vegas Raiders or the Vegas Raiders because their initials are LV, but sometimes you hear them 
called the Vegas Raiders. But anyway, I'm getting out on a tangent, so I'll look that up here in a second. But beat writers for the Vegas Raiders have said that uh, Jacobs is actually going to be doubling his catch total from last year. Like Derrick Henry, we were worried about his catch totals from last year. Wasn't very involved in the passing game. This year, it looks like they are involving him a little bit more. Hopefully, this isn't coach speak, because coach speak does kill all of fantasy because they always talk your player up, and then in the game, something different completely happens. Hopefully, this isn't coach speak. Hopefully, he is going to double his catch returns from last year. If he does, that's going to push him up even further on the RB list for the end of the season. The Broncos have come forward and said that they aren't going to designate a starting running back. What that means is they're going to be a running back by committee for the whole year, per se. Uh, We'd never know with injury, coronavirus, we don't know somebody might outplay somebody else. But Melvin Gordon, whose ADP was pretty high, and Phil Lindsay's, who was pretty low, now are going to be splitting reps, uh, same amount of touches per game, 10 to 12, 10 to 15, whatever it is. So Melvin Gordon's stock is starting to trend down, and Phil Lindsay's is starting to trend up. Up a little bit, but there's going to be a cap for both of those where you can't really rely on them uh, as it your starting running back. Now they're going to be more of your RB2, RB3 player, whereas at the start of the year, Melvin Gordon was being drafted as a very high RB2. Lindsey was being drafted as a very low RB3, almost the RB4. Uh, Gurley, the Falcons have come out and said that they're going to be limiting him to 15 to 25 touches per game. Don't know if that just means he's going to be getting the ball just handoff 15 to 25 times or even screens are going to be into that. We're not too sure. So this is going to limit him as more of an RB2 type player for the whole year. There are going to be weeks where you're going to bust into the RB1 conversation and even the RB3 conversation. But more than likely, he's going to float right around that RB2 conversation for the whole year, especially if they're limiting his touches. Cam Akers on the Rams side. Beat writers are now projecting that he's probably going to take over the starting job week six to eight, about halfway through the season. Darnell Henderson is going to be taking the load on the first half of the season, first quarter of the season. Cam Akers mixing in and eventually taking over the spot because he is the better player. Uh, We don't like to hear this as running back owners because running back by committees are terrible. Detroit is running one this year with Carrion Johnson. In Bo Scarborough and uh, DeAndre Swift, which is going to kill all of their fantasy value. Our running back by committees totally suck, and it's shaping out to be the Rams for the first half of the season is going to be doing the same thing. J.K. Dobbins for Baltimore Ravens is going to have a role in week one, probably more of an RB3, RB4, maybe a flex option. We're not too sure. They did say he's going to have a role, but Mark Ingram is going to be the starter. I foresee this happening for the vast majority of the season to where maybe in the back half of the season, it's going to be a full-on committee, which we don't want, again, for fantasy purposes. For the team, it might be good, but for fantasy, who knows what happens with running back by committees. Nobody likes them. Can't really predict who's going to break out that game. Um, Maybe they ride the hot hand one game. So you sit J.K. Dobbins because Ingram was really good last week, but Ingram has maybe, uh, you know, three runs for four yards. He's not really doing much. And J.K. Dobbins starts to blow out and break off these long runs. So that's why we hate running back by committees. Also on the Washington football team, Antonio Gibson is splitting first team reps. I eventually see him taking over for Adrian Peterson as Adrian Peterson is pretty old. Uh, Gibson is young. Uh, He is a rookie. He's probably not going to be fantasy relevant. I don't really see anybody outside of maybe Terry McLaurin on this team being fantasy relevant. They might be a good flex player. Adrian Peterson, Antonio Gibson as maybe your fifth or sixth running back just for depth. Zach Moss is going to be the passing down back in Buffalo for Devin Singletary. This is terrible news because we were hoping for him to develop into a three down back or it's looking like he's just going to be a two down back and then Zach Moss coming in for passing down work. Now we get into all of these running back by committees to bring you to the ultimate running back by committee, New England Patriots. Bill Belichick absolutely hates fantasy running backs. You don't believe me? Name a fantasy running back that has been consistent throughout their uh, tenure in New England. Oh, wait. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Nobody. This man hates running backs. He hates fantasy in general, but he hates fantasy running backs. Right now, they have Sony Michelle, Damian uh, Harris, 
Lamar Miller they just signed. And then you have your passing down back, James White. Don't forget they still have Rex Burkhead. And if he didn't opt out, Brandon Bolden. That would have been a total of six running backs. We don't want that. The only person you can feasibly possibly take out of this backfield would be James White if it is a PPR league as your flex option, uh, not an every week option. But Tom Brady liked to throw to him. I can envision Cam throwing to him a lot. Cam did like to throw to Christian McCaffrey. James White is not as good as Christian McCaffrey, but he's still a valuable asset in that backfield, especially receiving the ball out of the backfield. Last bit of news before we move on to the next segment. Josh Allen did say to reporters that he does want to run less. Doesn't mean that he wants to run the ball less and throw the ball more. He wants to scramble less. That was his biggest fantasy production last year. His passing numbers weren't too good. Deep ball accuracy, he was actually worst in the league. So him not wanting to run as much uh, is going to kill his fantasy value and put him more as a low-end quarterback too. He'll still be a super quarterback league, two quarterback league option, but as your starting quarterback, he might be a good five-week filler just depending on matchup, but he's not going to be your every week starter like I was really hoping him to be. So we'll go ahead and get into a player to watch and a player to avoid in the AFC West, my favorite division because that's where my Chargers play. So on the Raiders side, a player that I see shining this year is going to be Josh Jacobs. Yes, I know people are already drafting him high, but there's really good promising news coming out of camp that he's going to be in the passing game more, which means he's going to be valuable even much more than he was last year. So if we can hopefully this isn't coach talk and actually see it on the field, he will end up as a RB1 and where he's finished as an RB2 last year, he will be a RB1 this year. So he's going to be my player to shine for the Raiders player to avoid or disappoint this year will be Darren Waller. They added so many pass catchers to this team um, that I just don't see a lot of wealth uh, distribution. Uh, for Darren Waller, I think he's going to take a step back. He was a real breakout player last year. Who knows, I might eat my words on this one, but I don't see it. I see the team leaning more on Henry Ruggs or even Nelson Aguilar. There's been news coming out of camp that he's been showing a lot of good skills and he's actually catching the ball, which he didn't do in Philadelphia. So I I do see them distributing the ball out more. Um, You still have Tyrell Williams. He is suffering through a torn labrum, but I do see Henry Ruggs being the team leader in receptions and yardage. Now on the Broncos, uh, my player to shine is going to be Sutton. I do see Jerry Judy having a good year, but Cortland Sutton is going to take that next step uh, and become a every week wide receiver one. I do like Drew Locke and taking the next step forward in the passing game. They also brought a wealth of weapons for him, but I do see Sutton being the focal point of this offense. Can't really rely on any of the running backs. That's why my disappointment for this team is going to be Melvin Gordon. One injury history. He's never played 16 games in a whole season, and now he's going to be a committee back. Last year in Los Angeles, he was a committee back with Austin Eckler because Austin Eckler did so well when he was holding out. Now it's going to continue with his struggles where he's going to struggle in Denver because one, he's already said that he's not having a good time adjusting to the altitude, and now he's going to be in a backfield splitting reps with Philip Lindsay. On the Chiefs side, of course, Who else can shine bigger, brighter than CEH? Clyde Edwards Hilaire, this guy uh, was going to be my disappointment before Damian Williams opted out of the season, but guess what? He opted out, which means there's not really a running back to push for snaps. Yeah, you have Darrell Williams or the other D Williams that they have on the team because they have like 17 of them, or uh, Spencer Ware. I don't see that happening. So therefore, CEH is going to be my shine player for the Chiefs. My disappointment is going to be Tyreek Hill. Yes, I know. I couldn't really put Sammy Watkins here. I really couldn't put McCall Hardman here just because those guys weren't really relevant anyway. I don't see Travis Kelsey taking a step back. I don't see Mahomes taking a step back. So my only logical choice was going to be Tyreek Hill. I have him still being a top six or seven receiver in my fantasy rankings, but I mean, I can't really put, oh yeah, Sammy Watkins is going to disappoint. He disappoints every year. So this is just going to be me picking one of the best three remaining players on their team. Now let's get to my charters. My shine player is going to be Hunter Henry. He's coming back from injury. Hopefully he'll play all 16 games this year, but 
reports out of camp is him and quarterback Tyrod Taylor are having really good chemistry right now. Tyrod Taylor has even come out and stated that he feels most comfortable throwing to Henry. So that's really good news out of camp. My disappointment player is going to be Mike Williams. Now, Mike Williams has been a really good wide receiver three, wide receiver four option, but I don't really see a third receiver being able to be supported by our offense. First receiver being Keenan Allen, second receiver being Hunter Henry, third receiver being Mike Williams. I don't really see that. You also got to throw in Austin Eckler there. So I just don't see enough wealth to go around. So that's what Mike Williams, who has been fantasy relevant 10 touchdowns last year or two years ago. And then this last year, he had over a thousand yards receiving with about 80 catches. This year, I don't see that happening. So he's going to be my disappointment player. All right, guys. So I'm going to break down the Chargers for you. The Chargers made some pretty big moves this offseason. They bolstered the offensive line by trading for right guard, and then even picking up a a right tackle this offseason, bolstering that offensive line that was very hurt and very sporadic last year, not giving Phillip Rivers time to throw the ball. So now we have the right side of our offensive line set. We're getting Mike Pouncey back from a broken neck, center set. Now we just have to wait for Dan Feeney, hopefully, or Forrest Lamp to hopefully develop into that right or left tackle position that we were really hoping them to be, um, but injuries have kind of derailed their careers. Hopefully they'll take the step um, with a solid right side of the line. And then Sam Tevy on the left tackle position is still a question mark for the offensive line. This offensive line as a unit is 100 times better than it was last year. Bring in Tyrod Taylor, who's not going to throw 20 interceptions like Philip Rivers did last year, even though Philip Rivers, I love the guy. 20 interceptions is very terrible. Now we have Keenan Allen back. We have Austin Eckler back, Hunter Henry back, and Mike Williams. And we're starting to get some speedy receivers. So with Tyrod Taylor not throwing those so, so many interceptions and throwing the ball to really good position players, you have Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Hunter Henry. Austin Eckler, a stable of offensive weapons to get the job done. I see the offense taking a step forward, barring injuries. That has always been the Chargers' biggest concern, has been injuries. We've always been injury prone. It's just how it is. It's the life of a Chargers fan. Now, on the defensive side, we brought in a couple linebackers. We also drafted Kenneth Murray in the first round to solidify that linebacking core. On the defensive front, we brought in Linval Joseph, one of the best interior defensive linemen in the league. Fun fact about him, this will be his third stadium opening in his career. Started with the Giants beating the Cowboys in their home stadium open way back when he was first drafted. He helped open up the Minnesota Vikings stadium in Minnesota a couple years ago, and now he's going to be opening up SoFi Stadium with the Chargers. Just a fun little fact for him. We have Casey Hayward still, all pro Desmond King as well. Then you bring in the addition of Chris Harris, Nasir Adderley, our second round draft pick from last year is going to be finally healthy as our free safety addition. And Mike Quincy is going to be developing as that outside corner. We have a stable defense for our team. With all that said, I see the Chargers going 10 and 6 on the season, 3 and 3 in the division, second in the AFC West. Good for a wild card position into the playoffs. They are going to start 6 and 3 before the bye week. Some pretty weak opponents in there. You have Miami, question mark there. You have the Jets still there. You also have Carolina, a rebuilding year. And you have a bout with Joe Burrow, his first ever NFL game to start the year. You have some pretty easy opponents in that first half. Really, your only tough opponents are going to be the Saints, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and the Chiefs in that first nine weeks. Your back end is where you see most of the harder opponents. So I do see them going six and three before bye week, finishing 10 and six, good enough to make the playoffs as a wild card. All right, guys. So now we're going to get into our sponsors. Then Dre and Juju are going to speak to you guys for a little bit, and I'll see you back on the other side. This is message brought to you by the Foundation for a Perfect Package. Why do I need Manscaped? Why do I need Manscaped? Why do I need Manscaped? Because the only fruit I want is the one up top. Because being in a relationship is not an excuse to be lazy. Because I like talking ball, not smelling like them. Because deforestation is proven to prevent forest virus. Manscaped is the only brand dedicated to below the waist grooming. Manscaped's Crop Preserver guarantees that you smell your best all day long. 
Manscaped boxer briefs are the most comfortable underwear on the market. Manscaped's advanced skincare technology makes NYX a thing of the past. Manscaped is the number one in men's grooming. Subscribers get two free blade refills every three months. Get 20% off plus free shipping handling with the promo code SLUMP at manscaped.com. That's the promo code SLUMP at manscaped.com. Get your lawnmower 3.0 today. We are the Slump Busters. And we approve this message. I'm LeBron James. No, I'm not. But I'm the king when it comes to sports betting. Bet raiser. Razorsport.com. All right, guys, this is Juju Talk Sports. I'm joined by MMA Dre. Thank you to the Fantasy Aristotle for setting up this segment. We're going to be talking about that AFC West. Once again, shout out to our sponsors, Razorsport and Manscaped.com. That's Razor, R-A-Z-E-R, Sport.com. And Manscaped, use promo code SLUMP to save 20% off plus free shipping and handling. Okay, Dre, so we get to talk about Aris' Chargers on this podcast. So we promised to rip into them. They had five wins last year, which is almost as many fans as they have. Well, that's not a high total to really top, is it? Nah, not exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you've got more than five fans, yeah, in the stands is your goal. It's not a really high bar to set. And I think they're probably the fifth most popular football team in the city of Los Angeles as it is. But we'll stop living in the past. We'll stop living in San Diego. And we'll stop giving to Eris on this one. In all honesty, I do think that his team is bound for a turnaround season. So some notable Chargers headlines this year. So they let Melvin Gordon walk. We'll talk about him later. They let Philip Rivers walk. So longtime starter over there for the team coming off one of his worst seasons of his career. They made some adjustments to their offensive line, which I think will be a huge benefit to them. Breaking news injury-wise, Derwin James suffered a meniscus tear. We talked about Earl Thomas on the last episode. He may come into play again here. Linval Joseph, huge addition to their defensive line. Kenneth Murray, the linebacker of Oklahoma, they traded back into the first round to grab him. Great addition, one of the highest graded linebackers in the draft. Chris Harris, rather than opposing him on the other side, he's actually going to be a part of their team. Joey Bosa got paid this offseason, five-year, $135 million deal with $102 million guaranteed. So setting all those edge rusher contracts for years to come. Dre, when you think about the Chargers, what are your expectations for them in 2020? Yeah, I think that, you know, they'll be slightly improved from what they were last year. I I think they made some okay moves, right? Especially their defense. I think their defense is going to be fairly formidable. The offense, I still have my questions about it. I don't think it's going to be very explosive or very fun to watch necessarily. But I think they'll be able to compete. And so I have them going sort of middle in the pack. I have them going seven and nine this year. You know, Eris is going to be super thrilled about this one. I actually have them going 10 and 6. Because on paper, they have one of the best rosters in football. They really do. Joey Bosa, Melvin Ingram, their defensive backfield, as I mentioned, if Derwin James could get healthy and back on the field this year. And Chris Harris, I love Kenneth Murray. That was a great draft pick. And then Linvell Joseph at defensive tackle. My only question is, as you mentioned, how explosive is this offense going to be? And how long before they transition from Tyrod Taylor to Justin Herbert? This isn't a shot at Tyrod. But understand that the last rookie quarterback to not start a game his rookie year was Aaron Rodgers. And that was in the mid-2000s. They're going to want to play him. At some point, they're going to want to play the number six overall drafted player. Justin Herbert, I've seen a lot of game tape. He's more athletic than people give him credit for. He was originally the highest graded prospect going into last year's draft prior to Joe Burrow's renaissance season. Of course, Tua, there was injury concerns there. There was even questions of the Miami Dolphins drafting Justin Herbert over Tua. Do I believe that Justin Herbert is the quarterback of the future? That's hard to say just because, again, if you are watching Hard Knocks there, it has been a definite adjustment from going from Oregon football, which relies more on silent counts and not really being a vocal leader, to being in the pros where he's going to have to make a lot of those calls. I do have my questions about Anthony Lynn. And again, watching the show, I've grown to like Anthony Lynn. I respect him as a coach. Obviously, we've talked about the lack of minority head coaches in football before. But at the same time, he's not a play caller on offense for them. He's more of a CEO type coach. And that type of coach has been kind of on the decline over the last few years. So if this team doesn't have a winning season, I think potentially he could be walking out that door. That at least is definitely a piece on the table. How long before you see Justin Herbert step into this season? 
I don't know. I think it'll be, I would give it week eight. So past week eight, I think it's, you know, anything goes. But I think they'll give Tyrod at least that much, especially if he's winning and they're able to stay in games. Like we think that they should be able to, like their defense keeps them in the game. Offense does just enough to win. Uh, I think that we'd see Tyrod probably stick in possibly even a little bit longer. Yeah, Phil Rivers had one of his worst years, his worst QBR going back to 2007 last year, over 20 interceptions. So if Tyrod mm-hmm. could just hold on to the ball, you would think he'd be able to keep his job. Exactly. Exactly. I think as as long as he can do that, right, and squeak out some wins here and there, he's going to, you know, continue to hold that job. But again, if they start falling into a losing record, then I don't think that the Chargers have any reason not to pull that trigger. What record do you think Tyrod would need to have in order to, to retain his job for the rest of the season? I think if they at least stay 500 all the way up through there, I think that's okay. Because it's a lot to ask to have Tyrod completely turn it around. But I can also see the argument for like, well, if we're going to be 500, we might as well throw in our new shiny toy and see what we can get out of him. But I think as long as he could stay above 500, even if it's just slightly above 500, he's fine. The last time we saw Tyrod Taylor, he had an eight and six record as a starter out there in Buffalo. The team made it to the playoffs the first time that they made it to the playoffs in 18 years prior to him getting there. And the only like lone blight on the season was that he actually got replaced midseason for Nathan Peterman, who proceeded to throw the, the ball five times to the opposing team and get replaced by Tyrod again, middle of that game. We know that he's a competent NFL quarterback, but the question is when you do have that guy that you drafted with your first overall pick, you want to see him play. Even in Green Bay, a situation where they have a generational talent like Aaron Rodgers, there's questions of if Jordan Love could potentially get on the field this year. According to the training camp rumors, probably not. Like I said, I think Justin Herbert's going to see playing time. I'm going to say week six, we see that move made. Okay, next team up in the division, and actually coincidentally, the second Hard Knocks team in two years, we have the now Las Vegas Raiders. They're going to be playing in their shiny new home, but unfortunately, there's not going to be a lot of people around to see it. Mark Davis in ownership is probably super pissed that the NFL is going to be restricting fans this year because, let's face it, if you're opening a brand new stadium and a brand new home, you want people in the stands. I wanted to see people in the stands. How cool would it have been to see what those crowds looked like in Raider Stadium, Dre? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I always wonder, everybody says that whole adage of like, when you're playing in, you know, Las Vegas, do you ever really have a home field advantage? Just because so many people are willing to travel to Vegas anyways, let alone to go watch their team play. So I wanted to see, you know, is that going to be the truth or do you actually legit have some Las Vegas Raider fans? The other thing is Las Vegas, I don't know the demographics there, but I can't imagine that that many were always Raiders fans, right? Being in Las Vegas where they didn't have a sports team of their own, or I should say a football team of their own. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the local Las Vegas residents outsourced who their team was. And so, you know, there might not even be any real Raiders fans in Vegas, uh, let alone, you know, people that are traveling. Was really excited to see what the fan base sort of looked like and just what we could see across the crowd. And honestly, I was excited to go watch a game. Like, I would have driven down to Vegas just to go check it out. But getting back to the football standpoint, I think they, you know, had an interesting offseason. And something you and I were joking about, Juju, is they drafted like 20 wide receivers in this (laughs) draft. So I don't know how much that really helps them. They did attempt to fix their wide receiving group. They did have a training camp injury. Tyrell Williams is dealing with a torn labrum. But their first overall selection in this year's draft was going to be Henry Ruggs. He was the first wide receiver off the board. So over receivers like C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy, his teammate. This guy has dynamic speed. He runs in the four threes. He's a burner. He's essentially their version of what a Tyreek Hill can be. But they didn't stop there. They drafted a Lynn Bowden out of Kentucky, former quarterback actually, and Brian Edwards out of South Carolina. So they did have a commitment to get some weapons around Derek Carr. They added perhaps his biggest weapon, though, Jason Witten and his age 40 season. But on the bright spot, if they ever want to start a Monday night football broadcast on the field, they do have John Gruden and Jason Witten on the same sideline. So at least that's a possibility. And if they need draft analysis, they have Mike Mayock as their GMs. So they have the perfect television crew. Will that translate to them gain some wins? We'll see. Actually, speaking of Mayock's defense, he did a fantastic job with their first year's draft. So I'm not going to completely discount the players that they picked up in this year's draft. Max Crosby was a hell of a fine. 
We definitely were interested to see how Jonathan Abrams would have done if he didn't miss the season due to a shoulder injury. And then Josh Jacobs, their running back, you got to give him credit. The only real problem I had with the Raiders draft last year was at four drafting Cleo and Farrell. He hasn't really developed considering there was a lot of edge rushers at the top of the draft. There was the other Josh Allen they could have potentially drafted who went to Jacksonville and actually had a pretty decent little season there. They did draft Damon Arnett and Amick Robinson, so a couple of cornerbacks to try and fix that defensive backfield. Pair that with, of course, the signings of Jeff Heath and Demarius Randall. So they're trying to fix up that back end of their defense. I just don't know if they're going to be good enough or able to, because let's face it, you're facing the Chiefs. You have to keep up with that speed. You have to keep up with a ton of weapons. And then look at what Denver did. That's another team with a lot of weapons that you're going to have to try and contain. So I don't know if the Raiders have enough or if this division is just going to be airing it out consistently. And if they are, I don't know if Derek Carr can keep up. I have my questions there. Speaking of Derek Carr, he's potentially in a quarterback competition with Marcus Mariota. Marcus Mariota, who lost his job to Ryan Tannehill, basically out of training camp last year. I mean, the decision to go with Ryan Tannehill was in the back of Mike Rabel's mind heading out of training camp. And after a slow start, it was all but assured. I don't doubt that we could potentially see Marcus Mariota on the field this season. Dre, what would you say the chances of that happening are? I just think Derek Carr is the better quarterback, though. But I I agree. I think you're right. So I I think Carr is the better of the two quarterbacks. But I think it's also sort of run his course. And we can sort of see that with, I think, the Raiders just in general. Okay, so chances where, yeah, like maybe a 30%, 20%. You don't sound too high on it, but... I'm not high on it. I'll give it like, you know, barring injury, of course, right? Like if injury happens, then you got to go. But I think a full replacement with Marcus Mariota getting the start over Derek Carr just for football reasons, I'll give it about 25%. With all the weapons there, will we ever see Derek Carr at that 2016 form pre-broken leg? I am going to say no. I just think he's just had too much injuries and the injuries have gotten to him. We'll never see him back at quite that level that he once was. Show you mine. If you show me yours, what's your record? I still have them listed as the Oakland Raiders. I need to update that, but I have the Las Vegas Raiders uh, going 5-11. and 11. I have them one less than you. I have them going 4-12 and 12 in their inaugural season. And it's just, I was going through their schedule, and I was just having a tough time saying they're the better team. I think that they're going to be competitive. They're going to be scrappy. I was surprised that they were still in the playoff hunt last year, to be honest. But knock on wood if you're with me here, but I don't think that the Raiders are going to do that well this year. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Sorry, but it does bring up some interesting questions considering this is, what, year three or four of Gruden we've seen at this point, and this team hasn't finished over 500 yet in his tenure. So if we have another bad season, how do you start evaluating that 10-year contract at that point? Uh, I think it looks awful, right? I think you panicked and you just got, you know, sort of a name that you had thought was going to be tough and, you know, aggressive coaching or whatever it is that you think, but then it just didn't work out, right? So I think it's a bad decision all around especially to be committed for that long, right? What do you do at that point, though? Hopefully they're not strapped for cash. Coach contracts don't come out of your salary cap, I believe, right? So you can no, technically but you, move I off. mean, you have to pay them. If you have to pay them. They're guaranteed. So if you yeah. fire him after year three of, or year four, it looks bad because you're still paying him $10 million each year for the next six years. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's true. Though. It looks bad, but, you know, hopefully you have a whole lot of money on you and you can just move off, right? Like you got to, sometimes you got to make these tough decisions. Well, Mark Davis is the most cash strapped owner in the NFL. That's well documented, even though we see him at all the UFC events, having a good time. I don't know if Mark Davis has a good life or doesn't have a good life. With that haircut, I assume no. But then you think about how much money this guy does have. Even if I say he's the poorest owner in the league, still doing really, really well. The problem is, of course, again, no fans in that stadium this year. Actually, I'll ask you this, though, before we completely move on, because we have heard speculation that some teams might have fans in the stadium. Do you think, considering that Nevada was one of the states who was really eager to open up, that we will see fans at any point during the Las Vegas Raiders season? 
I think that we will. I think we'll see fans in there. As long as the casinos are, are open, I think that we will see fans in some capacity in the stadium, right? And it may be socially distanced in some weird way, right? Like you and your family can only buy, you know, a seat as long as there's two in between you and the next, you know, family or whatever. And they do every other row or something like that. I think that that's probably what we'll see. Of course, you know, you always run the risk of if everybody's traveling to Vegas again, now coronavirus is spreading like wildfire through Vegas. And then, you know, the whole city gets shut down again. And so hopefully that doesn't happen. But I think as long as casinos are open, yeah, we'll see some fans in the stands. Okay, the next team on our radar is going to be the Denver Broncos. So another team that we're well versed in coming from the New Mexico area, the Denver Broncos, they did a lot to build around their sophomore quarterback, Drew Locke. It's going to be interesting to see whether this guy is the Locke starter moving forward for the Denver Broncos. But around him, he now has Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler, their first two selections in draft, both dynamic in their own unique ways. They also added their biggest free agent acquisition is going to be Melvin Gordon. They traded for A.J. Bouye. He was right behind Jalen Ramsey in Saxonville, that powerful defense in 2017. At OC, to pair with Vic Fangio, former New York Giants head coach Pat Shermer. Now, there are some questions about this team, but at the same time, this team has been one of the most exciting dark horse teams, and that's not a Bronco pun, coming into this season. A lot of pundits are predicting this team to do big things, and I could see it just given they had a lot of hard luck losses last year. I don't know, Dre, if you remember, but there was several games that they lost in the final 30 seconds to final minute. There would even be points in which they would drive downfield. Joe Flacco would drive them downfield, throw the win- what should have been the game-winning touchdown, and then 30 seconds later, they would give up the game-winning field goal to Mitch Trubisky and the Bears. There was five games they lost last year. And if you take the combined total of all those losses, it was 18 points. That differential is definitely heartbreaking. Now, as far as their head coach, Vic Fangio, I've always liked Vic going back to when he was the Niners defensive coordinator in 2012 through 2015, basically their run of dominance defensively. However, looking at this team now, I have them finishing pretty well, but you do not. So I want you to kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, I just thought, like you said, there's always those coin flip games that you think they can change the next year, right? And that's just historically been true. But also they're transitioning at quarterback. And like you said, Joe Flacco was the one that led them to a lot of that. Now they've got, you know, sophomore quarterback in there. And so I'm just not really inspired by them. Maybe I'm just a little bit low just because I saw how many losses they had last year. And I'm just sort of extrapolating on their record, not necessarily doing the deeper analysis. But I just don't see them doing all that well. And especially I don't know about Locke. And so I've got them going 4-12. and So you don't think that Drew Locke is the guy? I'm not convinced yet. He sort of has to be for this year, but I don't know if he's the answer moving forward. Well, in five games last year, Drew Locke had a 64% completion percentage, threw for over 1,000 yards, and had seven touchdowns. And not only the additions that they made in offense that I stated earlier, but they do still do have Philip Lindsay on that team. They still do have Noah Fant, who they drafted first round last year, a dynamic playmaking tight end out of Iowa. We've seen plenty of those do well in the league before. Do you think this has potential to be a top 10 offense? Uh, it has the potential. I would say they're still probably a year away, though. Okay, so still a year away. So that would leave them finishing where for you, Dre? Uh, I actually still have them going uh, four and twelve. That's uh, four and twelve. Whew. So we I are, have them sliding back. <laughs> we are very far apart on this one. I have them finishing ten and six. I, I think this team is poised to be a very good team in this conference, a very competitive team in this division. I feel like a lot of those coin flip games are going to turn into wins because I think they have a better sense of direction. They have enough playmakers on the offensive side of the ball to be dynamic, and then their defense. I like their defense. Von Miller is not what he was, but he's still a very talented edge rusher. And Bradley Chubb is coming back off of that ACL. If he's healthy, that one-two punch of edge rushers, that's fearsome for a quarterback. That's tough if you're a quarterback. And then if you do have enough time, by some miracle, you have a lockdown corner and A.J. Boulier covering your number one target at wide receiver. So I think this team has the pieces to compete. 
whether they're going to be back to their 2015 Broncos form on defense. Very questionable. But Vic Fangio, considering he's their head coach, you know they're going to be tough on defense. The question is just going to be, again, can Drew Locke live up to the hype on offense? He was a second-round pick. It's not like this is a fourth-round selection that just happened to shine last year. Clearly, the, the Broncos thought this guy has potential, and they were happy as hell to steal him in the second round in 2019. So I don't think it's improbable to say that Drew Locke could be the franchise starter out there in Denver. It's time to give me PTSD because we have to talk about last year's Super Bowl champions, the Kansas City Chiefs. And boy, does that pain me to say that because if you ended the game seven minutes earlier, you would not say that. That would not be the case. Unfortunately, there was another seven minutes that game and the Chiefs, well, they dominated and Again, this is painful for me to say. I even had the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl going back to last year. I was the highest on the Chiefs. I just believed in Mahomes, and the Chiefs believe in Mahomes because they handed him this offseason a 10-year, $503 million deal. This guy's going to be set for life. He's going to be in Kansas City for the majority of his life. Hell, he's the part owner now of the Kansas City Royals. Patrick Mahomes is doing pretty damn well, I would say, for someone in their early 20s. But somehow, some way... The Chiefs have this mysterious salary cap that other teams don't have access to. They have this unique fund. They're getting bailed out by the NFL and Roger Goodell because they were able to also pay Travis Kelsey four years, $57 million deal, $28 million guaranteed. But it doesn't stop there, guys, because Chris Jones, they franchise tagged him this year, so he's going to be making a pretty decent money this year. And then they signed him to a four-year extension, $85 million deal with $60 million in guarantees. Clearly, uh, my only concern with this team is, is Brett Veach okay? I think his hand might be a little cramped from writing out all these big checks. A lot of zeros, a lot of zeros that he has to formulate. Dre, what do you think of the Chiefs in their offseason moves? No, I mean, I was actually surprised that they were able to make any of these moves. Like you said, they were so strapped for cash. I think at one time they had like, what, like 30 bucks or something it was? It was legitimately um, $177. Yeah, and I'm like, that's insane. No professional sports team with a hard salary cap ever has that little of, of cap space. And I know you want to maximize the cap as much as you can, but that was ridiculous. And then, you know, from my understanding, right, the the entire Patrick Mahomes sort of contract actually worked out better for him this year cap wise. Um, and that's sort of why they structured it the way that they did. So I'm incredibly impressed with their front office being able to make all those things work. I do worry that they're going to be so offense heavy. But of course, that's sort of their brand of football, right, is they don't, you know, have necessarily the best defense in the world, but they also don't need it. Uh, and then I also worry about their running backs, right? Like, so we know that they lost to Sean McCoy, Spencer Ware. They weren't all that productive anyways, but I do think that it always helps to have other options. Um, well, that's but, why they drafted in the first round quite Edwards were at 32. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And hopefully, you know, hopefully he pans out for him and, and does well. With all that being said, the Kansas City Chiefs are still the Kansas City Chiefs. They are still the returning, you know, Super Bowl champions, unfortunately, Juju. So I have them going 13 and three. I have them going 14 and two. I think I had them going 15 and one last year, but as much as it pains me to say that I know the Chiefs are a good team. They're a damn good team. They have great coaching. They have a generational talent at quarterback. And more than anything this year, they have continuity. You realize that the Chiefs are bringing back their top eight players in offensive snaps, all returning. And then they're bringing back 11 of their top 12 starters in terms of defensive snaps. So this team has a very clear direction. Run it back. They want to be defending Super Bowl champions. They want to be the first team to repeat in God knows how long. I think the last defending champion was the New England Patriots. They did get hit with a little bit of opt-outs. They were probably the second hardest hit team compared to the Patriots in terms of that decision. You actually had a couple cool stories, I will say. So I respect Damian Williams for his decision to opt out, given that he does have a mother that suffered from cancer. So of course, makes sense. All the respect in the world to that man. Uh, Lawrence Duvernay Tardif, so they're starting right guard. Well, he opted out because he actually is a medical doctor. And rather than playing football this season, he wanted to practice medicine in his home country of Canada. Very cool story. Shout out to you, Lawrence Duvernay Tardif, for all your hard work on and off the field. Yeah, 14 and 2 for me. Dre, you had him 13 and 3. Yep. Yeah. All right, absolutely. guys. Well, that's going to do it for us on the AFC West breakdown. We're going to head it back to Eris. Go ahead and check us out on our last divisional breakdown. We'll be covering the NFC West. Stay tuned for that. We'll see you next time. All right, guys. So welcome back. 
So just to sure up things for you guys, this year, more than ever, I cannot stress enough that you need to be following all of the news. Beat Riders, NFL, ESPN, Yahoo, CBS, whoever you want to follow, you need to follow closely. We don't have any preseason games to know who's doing good, who's doing bad. It's all just reports from camp. Beat writers aren't really going to lie as much as coaches are. They're not going to be calling out their players. Beat writers will tell you, ah, this guy had a bad week, or this guy's looking to edge ahead of this guy in the step chart. So make sure you're following all of the news you possibly can. Good luck in your drafts coming up. If you already did your draft, hopefully you did good. It's always a terrible feeling when you're sitting there after your picks and you're just like, man, I'm lacking at this position or I'm lacking at that position. It always sucks. So make sure you're doing all of your due diligence on players, watching for injury trends, watching for breaking news. You don't want to be that player who drafts Andrew Luck and then 10 minutes later he retires. Unfortunately, nobody saw that coming, but you can avoid drafting a hurt player unless it's like Debo Samuel, who is going to be coming back and we know he's going to be the team's number one receiver. So just pay attention to all of the headlines touch base with all the teams on NFL Network or NFL News, ESPN, whatever it is. Just make sure you're getting all of the news you can because this year, more than ever, we don't know what's going on. Hopefully your commissioners have a IR slot for your COVID players. Hopefully, if not, kick that commissioner in the nuts because what the hell is he doing? You're going to lose a player probably to COVID. Hopefully not, but we've seen it in baseball where with the travel and everything, it's hard to contain the players. It's hard to contain, isolate the problem and sit them out. So with that being said, good luck this year. Hopefully we can help you out. Hopefully we can get you that championship to your share. Hopefully we can bust that slump and get you a trophy so you can have all the bragging rights for a whole year. Until next time, guys, I'll see you later. Um, we're going to be coming out with our rankings. We're going to be coming out with sleepers. We're going to be coming out with all the stuff we did last year. So look out for that. We'll see you along the season. Send us your questions. Find us on all major platforms. Like, subscribe, download, rate, review, undo all that, and then redo it again. Help us out with those rankings. And let's just have a fun year. Let's always talk shit to our league mates because that's what makes fantasy football so much fun. Just the game. Have fun, talk shit, and hopefully you win some cash.